I think for me, one of the most memorable was um, go, climbing Sacramento, which was on the Tuesday of the, that's the one that's got all the big hype, right? Like the 30% grade and, and, um, and it's, I mean, make no mistake, it's hard. It's hard for sure. But you just got to, you're just, what I loved about it is that it just put you in, it put you by force into the present moment because the only thing you can can focus on is turning the pedal over. Um, and so I'm just on like the toughest part of it. And I look up and I see the guys, I see like Luis Mora and Abel and Douglas and all these like top end guys, like, and they're all kind of hanging out on this corner. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to get my breath. Cause I don't, here's the thing. You don't know how far you have to go. Like you just kind of never really know, even though Dan's saying like, you got 200 meters, you got this. You, like you never really know. It's just like a little bit of like this well-intentioned untruth that's happening throughout the entire experience, but it's wonderful. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to, okay, good. Oh God, thank God. Like they're, they're waiting. I'm going to stop. I'm going to catch my breath because my heart rate's through the roof. I'm just going to stop and catch my breath. So I start getting closer and they're like, yes, yes, and they're, and they're screaming and I, and they're like, go, go, go. And I'm like, no, no. And they're like, go. And I'm like, no, because I'm thinking I'm going to stop and I'm going to rest and catch my breath. And they're like, go, go. And then they're at a corner. So there's a corner I can't see around the corner. And I'm just dying because it's so steep and it's so hard. And they're cheering me on and they're just like sending me so much love. They've probably been standing there for 20 minutes waiting for me to come up. And they're just like, go to Jennifer, go to Jennifer. And I and I turn the corner and I see Jennifer. And it's like, you know, it's not as bad. So I think I'm kind of like getting to some kind of reprieve. It's probably around 15 or 18 percent, maybe a little bit more, maybe 20. And I'm coming up to her and she's like, that's it. You did it. And that like, when you're doing something that's so hard and you realize that you're done and like just this overwhelming relief and satisfaction and joy and belief in self, like it takes a lot for me these days to like have an emotional release. Like I spent years like having these huge emotional releases. So I got to dig really deep into the cavern for like any kind of residue of emotion that's still down there. And when she told me I was, and I was like, no, she got this all on film and she's like, yeah, you did it. And I was like, no. And she's like, yeah, you did it. And I'm realizing now that those guys were telling me to go because I only had a little bit more to go, but like that I was willing to keep going, even if it was like more miles you know, like I didn't override and stop and try and rest. Like I just trusted them and I went and then it was over and I was like, oh no, here come the tears. And I just felt this like well of emotion come up and I just let it come up and it was, oh my God, it was, that was the transformational moment. Welcome back to the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. I am Jess. I'm here with my love, my business partner, my partner in all things in this life and other lifetimes. I feel deeply in my soul that that is the truth. We are here with um, our May Osho and we, whoa, whoa, we are coming off a huge spring and uh, whew, it's been amazing and it's been such a um, such a gift of like, just watching how training the mind has allowed me to stay out of overwhelm um, with so much going on, races and travel and hosting yoga retreats and all that. And we're going to smack down some things here today. We had Ironman World Championship, St. George. We had the Awake Minds Yoga and Meditation Retreat in Nosara, Costa Rica. And then Beej and I came together for the Pura Vida Cycling Challenge, which we're just a couple days off of. And we just thought it was so important, even though we're still uh, burning off the fatigue, like so important to get these mics fired up. Um, well, it's just fertile ground to recap. And oh, that Pura Vida is just so alive within me. So welcome, Beach. Welcome. It's good to be here. <laughs> and that's not all. We have one, I have one more event as of the recording of this podcast. Yes. The Carlsbad 5000. The Ky Carlsbad 5000. With our youngest athlete, 10 year old Luca, will be running. It'll be his first race. Um, 
Is it'll be his, my his first 5K. His first 5K That's race. So cool. So cool. Yeah. And, and it'll be my first Carlsbad 5000, even though we've been here for almost six years. Yeah. So what is the Carlsbad 5000? It's the fastest 5K in the States. Fastest. And it's huge, right? How many participants? Huge. Thousands? A couple thousand, I think. Yeah. But really pulls an elite field here. I think typically it's been, e- I think it's typically been earlier in the season and it's coincided with Oceanside or us being in Mendocino. That's right. That's right. That's why we haven't done it. I think it was back to back. Oceanside would be on Saturday, and then the five k would be on Sunday when we first got here. Yeah. So I think this is actually later in the season, and maybe that's a shift that they're going to continue to make. I don't know. But um, yeah, you got a fast five k because Luca is not slow. Not slow. He is not slow, and he always wants to break his record. So. Luca's mom, Wendy Garofalo, has been on the show twice now. She's an amazing woman. Uh, she started the the um, company Evol, which is love spelled backwards, which basically was inspired through Luca, who is her son, who has autism. And for years, Wendy has told us, like, oh, he's going to be coming your way sometime because this kid is, like, such an athlete. So he's got, like, the pogo stick world record. Um, he's got a pogo stick now that launches him like 10 feet in the air. Uh, they're just, Rob and Wendy are just amazing parents. And, um, and then his sister Avi, of course, is such a, such a doll, but, um, they just allow, they've set up an environment for Luca to just thrive and to celebrate his gifts. And, you know, in the backyard now between like broomsticks and yard and yard furniture, (laughs) he's got like a steeplechase course and the whole backyard patio is all of his calculations. And it's just amazing. And so we've been asked to, um, be Luca's guides for his running. And I would have to say more so BJ than me because I can't run his paces. He's so fast. Yeah. They're my, they're my challenging paces. So he does eight, an 800 in, uh, what does he do it in? 330. So when I do my 800 repeats out back, I'm running 315 to 330. And that's what he's running his 800s at. So just put that in perspective. I think his fastest mile is six minutes. So he's, uh, He's extremely talented as an athlete uh, and, and just the way that his mind works and captures, you know, the, everything about moving the body and gauging it based on time. And now that he's got to watch with heart rate, he's getting uh, clued into heart rate. But uh, we're going to share the course together on Sunday, tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah. T- well, Sunday. Um, as the recording, as at the recording of, at the... <laughs> As this podcast is recording, if I had too much Costa Rican, Costa Rican coffee? coffee, cheers. Possibly. Cheers. I guess I'm just excited. Putting I, down some coffee if you're watching the video. Yeah, I'm you really excited. seeing that. Because it's Saturday morning. Usually we do these at night, but I've been, I think the last one we did was in the morning. We were drinking Costa Rica coffee <laughs> and now we're doing it in the morning, which is good. That's, med- that's my, my better time than the afternoon. Oh, and then... I know we're going to get into community, but Lewis, who we met down in at the Pura Vida Challenge, will be here in Carlsbad running the 5K. I know. It's so cool. It's so amazing. Lewis Elliott, he's a pro triathlete, still racing pro. Pro triathlete. Yeah. He'll be in Oregon as well, which is so cool. Okay. So before we jump in, I've got okay. I've got one thing, which if you look at the list of things that I just sent you, what's the first thing on the list? You're going to be like, what is that all about? It's this thing that I just learned about. I got the list. Yeah. What's the first thing on the list? Lone Star Tick. Yeah. Is that foreign to you? Lone Star Tick. Yes, it is. <laughs> so I just learned like literally a few moments before we started this podcast about this tick called the Lone Star Tick. And if you get bit by this tick, you have a uh, Rip system posted it. I thought it was a joke. And then I looked looked it up. You have um, a, a chance of... of creating a red meat allergy. How amazing is that? Allergic to red meat. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, that's, yeah, wow. <laughs> so if you've, so all those vegans out there and especially those who are in it for the animals, which I don't know, I just think like you go plant-based, 
you're like, yeah, this is good. Like, oh yeah, the food's good. And then you learn and then you realize like, oh my gosh, I never want to hurt anything ever again. Um, for those of you who sit in that camp, like let's celebrate this Lone Star Tick. Of course, I don't want anyone to get anything else that is harmful, but a red meat allergy, it's kind of like a dairy allergy. It's like a gift, a total gift. So how crazy is that? I love how the universe works. So ticks are now in service of the animals. You settled down there, Clark? All right, Um, that might be his Isn't that wild? Yeah, that is wild. I was just thinking about the gift of that, but also the non-gift of people who have nut allergies because they can never have peanut butter. Oh. You know how much I love peanut butter. Yeah. So you can see it as gifts or... You better watch out. What? Don't be... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, it was good to step away from the nut butter when I was in Costa Rica so then I don't have an addiction because I was okay. Yeah, I wasn't I even thinking it about it really. But yeah, that's interesting. Um, the Lone Star Tick. Lone Star Tick. Okay. Well, we won't spend too much time on that, but okay. if you get that red meat allergy, you may uh, acquire some symptoms after eating any kind of meat. Like it even said like pork, um, chicken, things like that. So, um, but you know, it's all for you. It's all for a gift. And sometimes we need a little kick in the gut to, um, to move us forward into the next phase of our evolution. That sounds like St. George for me. Oh, cool. All right. Well, we're going to get to that. The other thing I want to say is season three of The Awake Athlete is out and available. So it had been previously uh, available for The Awake Athlete community on Patreon, which if you've got um, some interest in that, we've got some space for you. We're just finishing up like, gosh, a four or six month um program with Don Miguel Ruiz's The Four Agreements. And so we might be going into the Gita. So any of you who are interested in studying the Bhagavad Gita, I'm going to bring it up to the group this Wednesday at our next meetup to see if anyone's interested in doing a dive into the Gita, which I think is the only pre-race book you need. It's the only book you need for this life. It's the every man's um, battle with the mind and how to come through the other side of that. And it's really cool. And I think it tells the story of Arjuna, who's the greatest warrior of all times, And, um, that's the athlete, right? Like we're warriors. We're out there being warriors. So. Well, that's the awake athlete tier. Yeah. So you can also support the podcast by just becoming a Patreon member. Yes. For as little as $5 and you'll get, uh, the first look at things such as season three of the awake. So after it launched to awake athlete, it launched to all patrons. Um, and I typically do 11 episodes a season. And so every day for 11 days, I would drop a new episode and, uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing how people are liking it. If you are liking it, um, and if you don't please leave a review on anywhere you listen is perfect. And, um, If you haven't listened to it, start with season one, binge on season one, binge on season two, and then roll yourself into season three. We're being interrupted by Clark. What's going on? We didn't take him out before the podcast. Did we screw ourselves? I think he's fine. (laughs) He couldn't be any closer to the mic. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, check that out. I would love to hear what you think about that. And more so, not so much like what you think about it, um, is what are you putting into action? Because that's really what matters. Like your opinion, sure. But you know, in the grand scheme that? of things, your opinion, our opinion, me, mine included, doesn't really matter. What matters is what's, what are we taking that resonates and what are we putting into action? Because that is what is going to equal that better world that Yogi Triathlete is on a mission to assist in the creation of, and that better world starts within us. Okay. So speaking of warrior, do you want to jump into 70.3? Uh, 70.3. You want to jump into Ironman St. George World Championship? Sure. Okay. Let's do it. Well, first, I think you, who went, who left first? You left first for the yoga retreat. Yeah. Maybe we should talk about that first. Well, let's just roll with this. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, because we left on the same day. FYI. That's right. I was for- <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So let's just keep rolling here. All right. All right. So like you went alone, you and Clark went alone. Um, so you drove from San Diego to St. George and this is your first world championship. Uh, when you signed up for this race, it wasn't a world championship, but it became a world championship, which you never really fought 
you know, um, some people were upset about it, but I know you weren't that upset about it. So my question is, having so many Ironman under your belt as far as participating but also supporting at, what was the vibe of this? Was, was the vibe a little bit elevated? Was it different? How did it feel? I think it was elevated. I felt everybody was you know, in appreciation and gratitude for being there, that there was a world championship being held and that no matter how they actually got there, it was still an Ironman and it just so happened to be a world championship. So I didn't hear much grumblings about like there were 400 first timers at a world championship, you know, first time Ironman, uh, I think Mike Riley said, or that uh, it was going to be brutally hot and the water was brutally cold and um, there were so many waves, you know, I just don't, uh, you know, wave starts at the, at the swim start. So I didn't really feel any, any of the negativity or the lack, although you know, when I went to went to the booth to register on that, I think it was the first day I got there, Wednesday, because I got ended up getting there a little bit early. It was really quiet, you know, really quiet. And I think the sentiment uh, of being a world championship was that it would be buzzing, you know, the energy would be picked up, and that people would be shopping and chatting and and uh, a lot more activity. But I never saw that. However, I've never been to Kona, so I don't know what the World Championship is like. I've only seen what I've uh, viewed on TV and what I've heard from other athletes. So uh, I think just an appreciation that we had a World Championship in St. George in a gorgeous location in a very, very challenging course. Yeah. World Championship course? For sure. Yeah. For sure. That's how I like it. Just like the 70.3 in St. George. With uh, the climb up snow, snow Canyon, yeah, but that run, that's to me like brutally, you know, go up long hills and then bomb down, bomb down a really, really steep hill back into town. Like that to me is, that's, that's awesome. Epic. Yeah. So what was your goal for the race and how did it go? So my goal for this race, knowing that it shifted to a world championship and that, um, I wasn't really going to qualify for anything. It's kind of like the first experience I had last September at 70.3 Worlds. Like you just go and race to race. There's nothing, I shouldn't say there's nothing at the end, but there's no opportunity to qualify for something more. It's simply a race that you participate in. And so that's how I took it. I was going in with it to um, to just be in the energy of the world championship and to race my race, be smart about it. And to um, and to surrender. I think I had shared with you. I had this hit to just surrender to the day. And surrender doesn't mean give up. It means to allow all things to be that guide for you, whether you expect it or not. So it's lowering resistance and increasing allowing. And I felt that really strongly when we did the, the, uh, the training swim on Thursday. I just felt so at peace in the water. It was cooler that day. It definitely warmed up on race day, but it was cooler that day. And I just al- allowed myself to swim whatever pace, feel whatever feelings I had, and to really just, you know, stop and look around. And I did that on the, after I made the second turn on the buoy the first, the second uh, right turn buoy in the practice swim, I just looked around at this place. It was just so gorgeous. And I pulled off to the side as people were swimming by and I saw, you know, the red rocks, the calm water in the distance, swimmers going by. I just really felt that energy. So I knew that was the direction I wanted to take on race day, just to surrender to, surrender to the day. So that was the goal? That was the goal. The only goal? Oh, the other goal was to was to run. I love this. I'm glad you, you pointed this out. Of course you do. Of course. I was like, he's not talking about the goal. I want to run the second <laughs> loop. <laughs> I want to run this. My only goal is to run the second loop of the run, and spe- specifically the last 10K, the strongest I have all day. I want to be the strongest, fastest, smartest, fittest athlete at that moment. You're going to show them how it's done. Yep. Okay. Last 10K. 
All right. So goal number one, surrender to the day. Goal number two, be show them how it's done on the second loop of the run. All right. So how did goal, how did goal number one go? 100% spot on. Okay. How did goal number two go? Absolutely atrocious. (laughs) (laughs) It was the opposite of, I think I could, I was the weakest, (laughs) slowest, (laughs) <laughs> and most challenging moments of the day were in the last 10K. Okay, so I'm curious about this because you were so fit going into this race. Like you said to me, I don't know how much more fit I can get. And I saw you last week at the cycling challenge and I saw you in Mendocino two weeks before, like super, super fit. So everything on paper would have said that goal number two would have been achieved and um, and everybody would still be buzzing about it. So what happened? What do you think happened? Nutrition. Nutrition. I wouldn't say nutrition. I would say electrolyte light imbalance. Yeah. Fueling was fine. Leading into it, I was spot on. No gastrointestinal issues until the final, um, final bit of the run. And I, I really firmly believe it was a lack of, uh, you know, lack of the body being able to find homeostasis. I, I, as much salt as I took in, I, I probably could have tripled it. Yeah. I think your history says hot days, your body will fall apart without. And I think I've seen that more than I've seen the opposite, that, that salt. And I saw your finish line fo- like video. You were just, you were like dusted in white snow. <laughs> Oh, the sweat marks. The yeah, sweat marks. you just had salt yeah. all over you. And I'm sure everybody did too. Like, I'm sure everybody did. Um, but yeah, that seemed to make sense. Yeah, that's the only thing. I tempered the day. Like the swim I went after because it's the first part of the day. I'm, I'm fit and strong. I don't think I burned any matches there. And then the bike, I definitely didn't burn any matches. I really kept it like a long Saturday ride. I you know, and it showed in my time, it was over six hours, but that was what was required on the day. I was fueling, I was taking, I wasn't taking my time, but I wasn't I was sitting back, but I wasn't pushing it because I knew I had to get to that run. And then the run, I didn't take it out too hard. I really didn't. Uh, I felt okay in the first half mile and then things started to feel good in mile one to two to three as you go down, you know, as you descend. Um, so when did you start to feel things shifting because at that point you start to feel them shifting at that point you're already like you're already well into it right yeah the second loop heading down to the turnaround point was when things really and what did it feel like what were the symptoms just stomach distress really not crampy just like tightness in the stomach a clenching um so probably your core muscles core yeah yeah, there's just stuff going on in there. Um, but and, you you just said you you didn't have any GI issues, so mm-hmm. it didn't feel like that. It was more no. like muscular. That's what it felt like. Okay. Yeah. And then the turnaround, I walked. I saw Lucho uh, <laughs> on that on that section, and he was like, "I thought you were going to catch up with me," and then we could go in together. Uh, but it was it wasn't meant to happen. But it was cool because we we gave each other a hug and you know, chatted for a moment or two and then we were on our way. But yeah, that, that ascent out of the turnaround when I got to the, the big hill vision started to get really narrow. I was getting really dizzy. Uh, that's when Carrie Lester, uh, had, um, pulled up alongside on her bike and was sort of helping me, guiding me through it. Uh, I had to sit down, I threw up, and I, this brought me back to Saint, uh, to Coeur d'Alene, 2010. And this is what, this is, this is the gold in this opportunity of racing this world championship in such hot conditions was that experience in Coeur d'Alene. I had a similar thing, very. So blurry. not Coeur d'Alene 2021, but Coeur d'Alene 2010, 2010. When I yeah. walked away from Ironman the two years after, yeah. because I was so distraught, which again, I had perceived I was super fit and strong doing crazy workouts leading into that race. Yeah, you were just overtrained. Overtrained, but I was also not dialed into nutrition because this this is the same thing that happened. The vision gets really yeah. narrow. I get dizzy. I had to sit down. I got the chills. 
in Coeur d'Alene, I went to the next aid station, got in an ambulance and went back to, to uh, transition. This time though, I pulled in my awareness to the moment. I was actually able to sit down, get hyper-focused on what do I need to do? Like, how can I finish the race knowing that I didn't finish the last one? And is this when you were sitting with Carrie? Yeah. And Chad, how is she, was, how is she supporting you? Oh, she was great. She wasn't too serious or, <laughs> or too, uh, too joking. She was perfect. You know, just really was there to like, just get, get your gauges, get up to that next aid station. That's the most important thing. Sit here if you need to sit here, take your time. You know, no, no pushing, no rushing. Um, and when I was able to get myself... Um, she poured some water on me, and uh, when I was able to get standing up again, because I wanted to keep moving, I didn't want to sit there for a long time. I wanted to get to the next aid station. My my focus was to get there and get Gatorade in. So when I mount, uh, got up to the top of the climb and started to take that right turn down that street, I think it's Bluff, uh, Daniel... Carrie had said Daniel was coming by. She's like, Beach, uh, Mr. Yogi, uh, your uh, vegan guy is coming. Uh, <laughs> so Daniel, I, I turned around and saw Daniel coming and I was just like, you got to keep going, buddy. You got to keep going. And he he checked in with me to make sure I was okay. But I was like, you got to go. You, you look strong. Keep running, keep running. So I'm glad he did. And then I was able to walk myself a couple hundred uh, meters to the next aid station where there was a bus stop. So I sat on the bus stop bench there for about 15, 20 minutes, took in Gatorade, took in uh, water and ate a banana. And I could feel my awareness and, you know, presence coming back, but I wasn't anywhere near close to running. So yeah, I walked it in, saw Hillary. She yelled at me to make sure I was okay too. And that she would let you know that I was, that I was fine. Cause I'm sure people saw on the tracker, my run pace was now a 20, 30 minute mile walk pace. And I walked it in and I was okay with that. Uh, The goal was to surrender and to finish the race. And uh, I laughed a few times at the very notion that I wanted to really finish strong. And yet I was walking all the way into the finish. Did you have any backlash, like ego backlash in the days following? You didn't? Mm -mm. Yeah, you said that. No, I was, it was just, it was the exact experience I needed. I know we talk about this a lot. It was the exact perfect contrast I needed to to refocus and shift myself back into the things that I can control that maybe I have backed off on a little bit as I've been racing because I've had a lot of success lately in racing. So we always have these reminders. So this was a perfect reminder that in hot conditions, I need to really, really boost up uh, my sodium intake and to really take that seriously because that's what derailed my, my run. There's no reason I should be running over five hours. You know, that run for me should have been around four typically. So as a coach, um, okay. So at this point I'm in Nosara, Costa Rica, and there's several triathletes and a couple of your athletes that are on this retreat with me and everybody's tracking you. And, and I don't have my phone because I basically locked it in the safe and didn't really have my phone all week. Um, and so Tracy, I looked at hers and, and I was like, how's he, how's he doing? I think this was before, I want to say this was like before our practice before, or, or it might've been like before dinner or something. Yeah. I think it was like before dinner. And she was like, he's at, you know, 19, and I was like, okay, all right. Yep. He said, everything's still looking good at this point. Then we all have dinner and then it's like, we're going up for our evening practice. Now it's like seven, close to like seven forty-five, and I go by the table and they've all got the tracker out and I'm like, how's he doing now? And they're, and you're at like 21.8 and everyone's like, well, it must be the tracker. And I'm like, it's either the tracker or he is absolutely falling apart. Um, and so it wasn't until much later, and you and I talked that night, wasn't until much later did I see that you that you did a 512 marathon, which, you know, my first reaction as your wife and, you know, someone who just wants you to meet your goals and all of that was like, oh, okay, all right, whew, let that go, there it is. And then the other one was like, well, welcome to my world, dude. Like, how does it feel to do a 512 marathon, right? And um, so as a coach of, 
you know, people who are super schooled at Ironman, but also people who are doing their first Ironman, knowing that this can happen at any point along somebody's journey, like how do you feel as a coach that this is, um, has this elevated you to a higher level of understanding or your ability to guide someone into an Ironman, um, to help them look at all the fine details of temperature and all of that? Like, how do you feel like that's that marathon time specifically, how that is going to help you as a coach, be a better coach? Yeah, I think those, the things that you mentioned, I think they're, should be in your awareness and you should do your due diligence and, and, and be tapped into the conditions and the course and, and all that. But I really took away that the race is never over. Like it's never over. It's, it's never over. Like when you believe things have been derailed and have, you know, spiraled out of control in the opposite direction of what you want to do, it's never over that you can use your skills of power of presence, that you can reassess the situation and reset constantly in a long run like that. Five hours, you have plenty of opportunity to stop, to breathe, to get nutrition in, to sit, to throw up if you need to, and really detach from that expectation that you had. So as a coach, I pull away from that Again, the strength of letting the outcome not drive you, but letting the steps in the moment that you're in be your North Star to get you to the end. When, whatever that end looks like, 12 hours, 15 hours, 17 hours, whatever that looks like. Because if you're constantly, if I would constantly be focusing on, oh, I want to run that 10K the fastest, I can't, you know, that's the only focus I have, then my mind isn't in the moment trying to see like what I needed to do to get me to, to keep going forward, which was to stop, to throw up, to get some electrolytes in, and to take my time and detach from everything else that said, I'm fit, strong, I've trained for this, I should be running, you know, a four hour marathon. So I think. I think a lot of it's detachment. I think a lot of it's utilizing your mindset skills. It's never over. And I think the contrast of what happened in Coeur in 2010 to what happened in St. George in 2022 are completely similar, but, but the outcome is completely different. Oh yeah, the way you handled it, but also the way you went into it. Like you went into Coeur d'Alene 2010 super overtrained. You just were, you were exhausted. And that was reflected in your swim time. Remember you did like a 120 something, which was so out of your out of your realm of what your normal swim would be. Um, and everything was just, you were just dragging, dragging, dragging. But the imbalance of electrolytes and all of that was essentially what ended up taking you off course, which is kind of what took you... Um, uh, that five, five, whatever marathon in St. George. But, um, but I don't think by any means you were overtrained going into this. I think you were, you I was were perfectly super trained. fit. Yeah, yeah. You were super fit. And we saw that when we were in Costa Rica, how fit you were. Um, okay. So what, um, so one final question is like, what are you going to put, what are you going to put into play? This is so cool that you had this like world championship dress rehearsal. Cause now you've got the one that you've qualified for, which is in October. What are you going to put into play knowing you've got a super hot, you're going to have a super hot day again. So let's just forget about the course and all that stuff and everything. You're going to have a super hot day. So what are you going to pull? What did you learn from this that you're going to put into action for Kona? Yeah, right away it's to, to boost my electrolyte intake on the bike, on the bike. So when I get to the run, when I do my brick runs, uh, in the early afternoon heat of Southern California, I'm going to, I'm going to be prepared to handle, um, handle the effort and, and somewhat the distance needed to really put myself into that feel of the feel of where I was at this point, but, but being able to handle it better. So can we carry um, that goal in Dakota that you want to run the yes. last 10K. Yeah. yeah. You can show them Let's how do it's it. done. Show how, show them how it's done. <laughs> Let's do it. 
<laughs> that's super fun. Yeah. That's really cool. Let's, yeah, let's think, carry that in. I'm sure there'll be other goals. And of course, the ultimate goal is always to finish. But let's see how, um, let's focus in on that. And um, yeah, and do I, the due diligence. I think a few bricks I'll do too, if you want to talk specific training, just there'll be a few bricks, not every brick, not every week. <laughs> Am I going to go long? But I think it's beneficial to do a few runs off the bike at an hour to 90 minutes uh, and test myself every so often in the in the heat of the day on a long Saturday session. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah. Yes. Not, not to put me in a hole and not to do it all the time, but just to get that feel. Um, yeah, I'll put that into practice. I think that's the most important piece. Cool. Learn. Yeah. All right, so I'm I'm suffering in St. George by myself, Mm -hmm. so much so that Clark wasn't even, you know, aware that I was on the run course when our rover guide took him out there to come see me. And I was like so excited and giving him hugs, but he was just so enthralled with every other runner but me. Um, And I will say that there were some people on the retreat that were concerned about Clark with you being on the course so long. So, but you had Clark covered. Yeah, this amazing, amazing rover um, guide uh, took care of him. Like you, ha- you already had it set up. All like- set up three times. She yeah. brought him to the race course. I mean, come on. Um, and that was my one emotional moment. I left him and started running again. Just like started tearing. It was like flooding because um, I got to see him, and my I really wanted to see him during the day. I needed that, but he, you know, this is the great. This is the great lesson again. Like he doesn't care. He's in the moment. He wants to see all the other people. Not really concerned about dad. So it's funny the the emotional ties that we create with our animals. We create it. They're always in the moment. They're always in the moment. Beautiful lesson. So we're doing that and we're missing you because you're in Costa Rica again. Um, so what was it go- what was going on down there? Like fill me in on on your side of of this experience. I'm in St. George. You're in Nosara for the second time. Yeah. So I flew in three days before the retreat. So the retreat started on Saturday the 7th and Megan, Valerie, and I all flew in on Wednesday the 4th. And we stayed up in this area called Cocoa Beach, which is about three hours north. And it was Oh, that was, yeah, that was amazing. It was so nice to be able to land, but back up the truck just a little bit, all of the things that we were traversing leading into it, um, you know, training for an ultra marathon and then kind of surprisingly, as we decided to jump into this Pure Vita cycling challenge, then all of a sudden taking my bike that I'm doing like one to two times a week as a recovery only and putting that into training for the biggest, you know, four or five day event I've ever done in my life. And, you know, running the ultra marathon, coming home from that, being absolutely, the physical body was just absolutely exhausted, just holding space for people, racing, um, and, you know, and coming home and being like, you got to get out there on the bike. And so titrating the exhaustion with rest, with training. And also this, this underlying, like, you cannot come into this. You cannot come into this retreat hot. Absolutely not. And I just, I take that role as being a retreat leader very, very seriously ab- above all else, above my success at Mendo, above my success at the Pure Veda Cycling Challenge. Like, people are going on a yoga retreat for many, many different reasons, some just want a relaxed vacation. Some want to hit, you know, higher levels of consciousness. Some are really healing from some some wounds in their life. And so as somebody, I hold that with a great amount of responsibility to come in a hundred percent and and with the ability to hold that space. But also I will say hold that space without great effort. And that means me coming in in balance. So we came in three days early and it was so wonderful the way it all aligned. Basically the girls, uh, Valerie and Meg flew together and their flight got a little bit delayed. So by the time I came in, they had just picked up the rental car and we met at the airport. We drove to our place, which was like a half an hour. We stopped at the grocery store, got some groceries and then, um, 
you know, got to the place, I made dinner and we had a glass of wine. And then we decided that every day we were going to have like a mini retreat. So every morning we woke up in silence. We did our own personal yoga practice. We gathered in the living room and we meditated together for 45 minutes. Um, we prepared and ate breakfast in silence. And then we broke the silence after everybody was done, um, with their, with their breakfast. So we had these little mini retreats every morning. And, um, and then we would like sit and we would look at the schedule and we would look at the workshops and we would, and we'd start to fill in the details as, as that information came through us. And then we would say, okay, that's enough. Let's go to the beach. So we get our suits on and we'd walk to the beach and we'd just lay on the beach. And then as information would come through about the retreat or different things that we wanted to integrate, we would talk about that. And then we'd say, okay, that's enough. Let's go walk on the beach. Or Meg like went for a run. Um, Val and I, you know, we went into the water and went swimming. And and um, we did that for Thursday and Friday. And, you know, I made dinner at night. One night we went out to dinner and it was just, it was great because we were prepping for the retreat, but we were also like, let's go into town, do some shopping. Like, let's go be a tourist. Um, let's go get an acai bowl down at the coffee shop and let's, um, you know, let's, let's plan dinner tonight. Let's go out to dinner. So it was really cool to have those three days. It was just perfectly balanced. And then Saturday we had, um, a shuttle scheduled to pick us up at the airport at 10 a.m., which is um, so awesome because Costa Rican time, by the time we got in the shuttle, it was like 1230. Um, and they're so, and they're so, Costa Ricans are, they're so polite and they're so like 15 more minutes, 10 more minutes, two more minutes. The the van's come pulling up right now and all of that. But they're as, as, um, as I have coined this phrase on, um, throughout the cycling challenge was like, there's so much well-intentioned lying going on. <laughs> Cause like it was, the shuttle was like two and a half hours according to, you know, United States late, but according to Costa Rica, it's right on time. And, um, so we all piled in and we met, we were able to travel with people who were on the retreat. And there was also another retreat that was going on while we were there. And we had a couple of people in our shuttle, who, um, who were going on that retreat. So the shuttle was going directly to blue spirit, which is depending on the driver you have is either a two is a two to three hour drive. And this driver was a three hour driver. Um, but I've had like, you know, close to two hours getting there with, again, depending on the driver that you have, but we stop on the side of the road and we get fresh coconut water and, um, it's a beautiful ride. So you go through all these little towns and very, very flat and then you see the mountains in the background and then you just start going up and you're like in the mountains. It's really beautiful. And then the last 12 miles into Blue Spirit is an unpaved, ridiculous potholed road that takes so long to get down. And then all of a sudden you see the gates to Blue Spirit and it opens and you're like, whoa. And it's, I think it's like a 300 acre retreat center, the property itself. All of the power lines, everything is underground. Um, so you just basically like the gates open and you're just in this paradise of, you know, biodiversity and abundant life and, you know, vibrancy to a degree again, that I have never experienced. Blue spirit itself is, you know, so high level. Um, even in our experience, you know, in, in, um, Alajuela for the bicycling challenge, Blue Spirit itself is just, it's a paradise. It is heaven on earth, the monkeys, everything. So yeah, so we had 19 people who came on the retreat. So there's 22 of us together. And um, we spent the week in meditation, in yoga, in deep self-work, um, in hysterical laughter, um, open water swimming. Some people were running on the beach, uh, napping, you know, all that all that good stuff. It was a very, very deep, beautiful, peaceful um, experience. And people were doing a lot of work there too. Well, what does, um, what did a typical day look like for someone? So a typical day looks like 6.30 a.m. yoga. So toes on the mat. 6.30 a.m. we do morning vinyasa. So that's 
typically a more rigorous vinyasa class followed by meditation. And we cycle through, the three of us cycle through the teachings. So let's say the first morning um, Meg taught the vinyasa, I did the meditation, right? And then we go to breakfast and we do it in silence. So every morning there's an option for silence. Um, not everybody takes takes you know a liking to that that, or they don't do it and that's fine everything is optional but there is a group you know there was a group of us again this year that went into silence and it's just it's so gold it's so golden you know silence is not absence silence is presence and so when you're present you just open to all things and so your experience in silence especially when you're eating beautiful high vibrational food just elevates um the whole experience to a new level so we ideally we want everyone in silence from the time that they arrive to yoga but you know with 19 people people are like oh where should i put my mat they're like oh i'm so oh wow it's supposed to be in silence oh sorry you know and so we do our best um And, um, so we do morning vinyasa meditation and then we go into silent breakfast. And so that ends at 9am. Then we break the silence at nine. And during silent breakfast, we encourage you no phone, um, no journaling, no reading, because those are still doing things. So have an experience in silence, just pure experience of presence. And then you've got free time. So you've got a 700, uh, foot path to down to the beach, which is just raw beauty, raw beauty, amazing. Um, swimming, you've got a saltwater infinity pool, which is gorgeous right on property. You've got um, beautiful, for the most part, everybody opted for an air conditioned room because it is super hot and humid. Um, or free time. So shopping, they have the best gift shop. As you know, you're like, what did you buy? I'm like, pair of pants, two tank tops, a dress. Um, They have the most amazing gift shop ever and all locally made clothing. Mm. So you're just like, oh, I totally want to buy from this this place. So it's like everything you need is right there. So yeah. And then 12 o'clock, it starts lunch, 12 to 1.30. So at any time you can come and have lunch. All your food is included. Every meal is included in the price, and the the price is, I think, f- super reasonable. And coffee is always supplied, or coffee is okay. on always flowing twenty, yeah, twenty four seven. So coffee is always available, which is such a treat. And then there's also a cafe where they've got smoothies and superfood bowls and amazing desserts, a lot of vegan desserts. Um, and then if you want lattes or Americano or something like that, you can always get that at the cafe and then it's super dangerous cause you can put it all in your room. Um, and then five o'clock we would gather for sundown yoga, which takes us right into sunset. And then we go down for dinner and then at night we'd gather again at 7:45 for our evening practice. And the evening practice would be anything from just straight up meditation to a discussion and meditation to yoga nidra, gong bath, which if if you never experienced a gong bath, it's just beyond like your whole body is just fully buzzing. People were reporting just like how high they felt and I think that that's just the level of consciousness. You're set, you just feel your cells. You feel your cells vibrating in this environment. So that's kind of a typical day. Morning yoga and meditation starting at 6.30, silent breakfast, free time, lunch, free time, yoga at 5, evening practice at 7.45, um, dinner at 6 p.m. I think that things are going to shift a little bit next year. I'm, I'm going to make some recommendations that a couple of nights we actually don't gather at 7.45 that we extend our 5 p.m. practice so that people have more free time at night to go to bed early. With a bigger group, we're realizing that things take a little bit longer um, and we want to give people just more pockets of space. So if The other thing that we do is we add in workshops. So that's the typical day. But then on some days we have a workshop. So we had an intro to Ayurveda workshop, which was about an hour and a half, two hours long. And again, everything is optional, but we want to provide space for people to come and and learn as much as they want to learn. We had a workshop on the law of intention and desire. We had a cacao ceremony on the final night. 
So we do pepper in some open discussions and group gatherings throughout. But then um, you also have options to go into town. So people did a kayaking trip. We went to the Cebu Monkey Sanctuary. People would just walk the beach. It's about three miles to town. So they'd walk the beach downtown and they'd go shopping, whatever, and then walk the beach back or take a, take a taxi back to Blue Spirit. So there's plenty of things to do or you just chill. People were just like, oh my God, I haven't read a book in three years and I just read a book in two days. So you can kind of make it as full as you want or as low key as you want. What, um, yeah, that sounds like a dream week to me, it's, it's, especially the silent breakfast. You know, I just love and the Love food is adventure. amazing, right? Yeah. So every day, fresh papaya and pineapple and, you know, coconut, everything, coconut, plantains like coming out of your eyeballs. Um, the food is absolutely delicious. And no problem to eat vegan. Absolutely right? no problem to yeah. eat vegan and no problem to eat gluten-free. Yeah. If you're a gluten-free person. And they do offer um, fish sometimes and eggs sometimes. Um, so if that's something that you, and you know, that you enjoy in your diet, those things are available too, but to eat vegan is super easy. Did anyone, was anyone challenged and obviously don't, don't detail names or anything, but yeah, but what, what were there fears? So this is because um, this is a great opportunity to provide support and we'll get to this with Pura Vida, but, um, Anybody have any fear or hesitation at all coming to the country or being in the country? And then how do they, did anyone overcome that and have a new relationship with it by the end? Um, yeah, a hundred percent. There were a few people that, um, I, I did not, I, I wasn't involved in this, but a, a few people who Meg was supporting, um, in, you know, just not getting overwhelmed with what they needed to do to get down there. So, um, mm. You needed a test. You needed a, a negative test to get onto the property. Like, you know, um, they're pretty tight down there. They've lifted the vaccination mandate. But um, Costa Rica itself, you don't need anything to get into the country. But Blue Spirit was requiring a negative test. And, and um, you know, just navigating things like that, the mind, you know, overcomplicating things and, you know, uh, lack of presence, right? And so Meg did a great job. And I think Valerie did a lot, too. Um, just helping people just navigate, just, okay, you know, it's just right here, right now. It's, it's all going to be okay. There were a couple of people who were coming in who actually were sick, um, in the weeks leading up. And so just offering that support to them that, you know, just be here right now, you know, focus on what you want, not on what you don't want. So a little bit of that moving into, into the retreat um, and then there were some things in real time. So on the Sunday, they always do an orientation and, and it's great. Blue Spirit does this orientation. They have a whole longevity center. So you can go in there, you can get your inner age, you can get ozone therapy treatments. You, I mean, there's so much you can do. They have a whole detox program, which, um, so far nobody's really taken advantage of because the food is so amazing. Um, massages, all of that. But one thing they cover in that orientation is like, Hey, we, you know, we want you to check, get things, start to get things squared away on Friday to check out and blah, blah, blah. And we kind of checked in on that later that day. We were like, how's everyone doing with that information? Like they're talking about checkout and we're on day one. And so we just want to check in, see how everyone's doing. And there was a handful of people who were like, yeah, that really stressed me out. So we just work with those things in the moment. It's not that Blue Spirit needs to change anything. And this is what a retreat is all about. It's about being open. It's about being honest. It's about realizing that the, the fret that you may be experiencing is being shared by others as well. So there were things in the moment. And then, of course, like as you open, as you soften, as you lean into the connection with others and you do these very powerful practices of yoga asana, um, gong baths, meditation, discussion, things like that, you open. So, yeah, there were tears, but they were like good tears, right? And there, and um, sometimes we would just play really beautiful, powerful music and, you know, you would just see people flowing so gorgeous with like tears streaming down their face. Um, and, and so it was that to me, that means, wow, that we have created this really safe space for people to just have an experience and nobody's like, are you okay? Are you okay? And I think that that's something that we learned in live, love, teach 
is like, just allow people to have their experience. Like if there, if there's energy moving, let it move and offer, create a space through your own energy and your own intention. And I'm talking about as the hosts of this, that, that supports them without even having to say a word. Um, and then we always make sure we, people know we're available. Hey, we're available. So people would just, you know, grab your ear at the pool or walk on the beach or whatever it was. And, and we, there was a lot of one-on-one discussions and a lot of one-on-one work throughout the week. So we're available all the time. And it was really cool that people were taking advantage of that. Yeah. I think the support community is a thread that's in all these things that we experienced in the past month or so. Mm-hmm. Um, Really important to have that, and I think it adds that extreme comfort level to get them over the hump. Um, who's this for? Who who would who would benefit from coming to a retreat? You know, your yoga retreat. Man, like I said, there. I mean, I felt like some people just needed a, like a relaxing vacation, um, and some people really were desiring deep, deep meditative work. Uh, so it's for everyone. We had as young as you know twenty somethings you know, athletes, triathletes who were running and there was open water group, open water swims every day, which was so cool. And the swimming was just amazing. Uh, one of our guests, you know, was out there by herself because it was just a better time for her. And, um, she told this story about how she was out there swimming and, and, um, she kind of started to get in with the, there's a lot of rocks, but you kind of figure out how to get around them and stuff. And all of a sudden there was all these fish and, um, and if she's listening to this, like, I, I hope I'm telling the story correctly. Uh, but this was when she told me, this is what I got from it. And it was kind of like, okay, whoa, whoa, all these fish, like, okay, what, what else is out here? You know? And she just, whoo, kind of like popped up, took her goggles off, like took some breaths, like you're fine. You're fine. And she's out there and this ocean's pretty legit. Um, It just happened to be on the last day. It was as calm as could be, but in the other open water swims, it was super choppy, Um, but it was super fun. I loved it. And so she kind of got herself calm, right? Because she's capable, put the goggles back down, started swimming. And all of a sudden she said this like three feet across the sea turtle went right underneath her. And it was like my my expression of this story is, Had she fallen into that fear, had she panicked, had she turned around and swam as fast as she could back, had she not given herself the opportunity to use the tools that she had to calm, she would have missed this just once in a lifetime experience. And she was out there all by herself. It was so amazing. So that was super cool. Um, yeah, who's it for? It's for everyone. So that was kind of the younger end of things. We're in 20s. And then we had a couple gentlemen who were probably in their 60s. Um, so and everything in between. So it's for athletes. It's for people who are, you know, just getting into yoga. It's for people who don't even practice yoga, but are super curious about an immersion because there were some people who really liked yin yoga. And every morning we have a vigorous vinyasa. So they would come um, and they would kind of do their own thing and lay on the mat and breathe because they realized that yoga is not the pose, but the pose is the vehicle for the yoga. So it didn't really matter what they were doing. And then they would join in for the balance and the yin portion of the class. And then sometimes like they would, like there was one gentleman, sometimes he just came for the yin portion. It's totally cool. Like everything is optional. We encourage you to take advantage of all of it, but we'll meet you exactly where you're at. Um, so it's for everyone. It really is for everyone. It doesn't matter if you can do chaturanga. So one of us, so one's always teaching, except for we did a couple classes where the three of us taught, which is super fun. Um, because the three of us together represent, um, this perfect balance because I am fire and Meg is earth and Valerie is air. So we actually represent the three doshas in Ayurvedic medicine. So we, when we co-teach, it's pretty cool. But typically one person is teaching and the other two teachers are up front practicing and one of the teachers is typically always doing the modification. So the practice that does not include any chaturangas. So it's pretty cool how we do that and that just kind of naturally falls into into play. Cool. Yeah. So what's next? Maui. What's the next one? Maui. Oh, Maui. That's right. September 28th, Maui. Come join us. 
Um, it's a five night retreat at Lumeria, um, educational center. It's beautiful. We've got a sacred site visit on the schedule. We'll be doing some workshops. One of the workshops that just kind of was born in the moment down there was a 90 minute workshop, which, which was so cool. And, and we I don't really, Valerie and I were talking like about the word workshop, but that's just the word I'm using right now. But we did like a meditation, like a 25 minute meditation. Then we did like a 15 minute walking meditation and then like another like 30 minute meditation. It was this really deep experience. It was very cool. So we'll be doing, um, that, that also includes, um, your breakfast every day and then some lunches and some dinners and all of that stuff is all, is all, uh, mapped out because we're three miles from Paella. And so we wanted to give people the opportunity to go into town. A lot of times, like you're just not hungry at night. You know, you can take your lunch back to your room and have a little bit later on. Um, so yeah, that we have space available and we would love for you to come and join us. And if there's anything that I learned from us jumping into the cycling challenge is like to live now is it just rewards you so greatly. So if it's something that you're interested in doing, just live now, put your deposit down, do it. Like you're always going to have a reason not to, you're always going to have 25 reasons not to. So you can either live by those reasons not to do something, or you can listen to that part of you that says, wow, that would be really cool. Like me in Maui for five nights on a retreat. What? That's so like nothing I would ever allow myself to do in the past. Do it. Join us. I promise you, you will never be the same again in the best way possible. And if you're headed to Kona for the world championships, it's the week before Kona. So yoga retreat on Maui, fly over to Kona, participate or spectate the world championships. And uh, to me, that's, that's just... That's just awesome. It's totally <laughs> awesome. Epic. And you're going to have 50 reasons not to do that. Right, right. But do it. Yeah, do it. Do it. Do it. Keep things in circulation. You know, like we have this this ethic of like save. So you got to save, you got to save, you got to and And if you look at the yoga sutras, it's like when we're hoarding money like that, we're asking someone to come in and steal our money because we got to keep one of the laws of this, the metaphysical laws is the law of circulation. We got to like give, we got to receive. And this includes money. It includes money. Money is one of the biggest things that humans are here to be free of, meaning be free of through their mind. There's nothing wrong with having a ton of money. There's nothing wrong with with letting go of a ton of money. There's nothing wrong with giving when your bank account says you shouldn't give. There's nothing wrong with receiving when your bank account says you shouldn't receive. So it's the law of circulation. If not, we get stagnation. And I think money, because we put so much weight on money in this life, that that actually can be the source of a lot of stagnation in our life. And so we had to learn that by burning in the fire of, you know, financial dismantlement. And I wouldn't change any of it because mm -hmm. I, I feel like I've got that freedom. And, um, and I encourage everyone to, to, to step into something that might feel a little uncomfortable knowing that, um, when we trust what's on our heart and we act from that, that we will be cared for, we will be taken care of. And especially when we're talking about something like a yoga and meditation retreat where we are evolving our souls and raising our consciousness, like your ability to manifest and align with what it is you desire in this life, maybe that is financial abundance, you will be able to do that with greater ease. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Okay. I yeah. know we're at an hour, but we, and, and we did do a lot. Is there anything else on the retreat? No. no, I think we're good. Okay, yeah. come to Maui. Come to uh, Maui. I can't wait. BJ will be there. Um, and then I'll be in Kona. So, so the we're at an yeah. hour now, which is typically what our podcast is, but we can't, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the Pure Vita Cycling Challenge. Uh, so let's give that, you know, about 10 or 15 minutes. And and I feel like we've talked about this a lot already with our last O show, also with Dan and Jennifer's podcast. We'll link that up in the show notes. If you didn't listen to it, we go through all the stages of the, um, of the cycling challenge. And now here BJ and I sit on the other side of it, um, knowing that it is a hundred percent doable. 
uh, if you've got a base and you've got some some handling skills, you've got some gears on your bike. You've got gears on your bike, and you've got a solid mindset. Like this, it's beyond um, whatever would have considered that I would be able to do, and I did it. I did it. So, um, so yeah, let's uh, let's just talk about this. Well, also, if they want more, like we re- we yes, that's what I want we to say. recapped every stage on my Instagram account. So Brian Gumkowski on Instagram, five videos, five stages, and then I've got all the stories in the highlight section yeah. from each day. Me so that's too. a good place, and Jess does too at Jess Gumkowski uh, on Instagram. So those are really good places to see. Um, to dive into a little bit more of what the day was like and the people were like and the energy was like, but yeah, I, do, I still want to, I still want to recap some important moments that we had, I think, along with this tour. And, and I think it started with both you and I coming into it in on paper would not be ideal scenarios. You coming off a yoga retreat, not being on your bike for 12 not days, even, not even being close to your bike. You're in a different country. Your bike was here, right? <laughs> Totally. <laughs> and I was in St. George racing an Ironman with Jennifer. Uh, and then a week later, start this five-day epic challenge on the bike in a foreign country that the train is either up or you're going down. The easy recovery flats are like 4 to 8%. That's, that's Costa Rican flat. And it, and it actually feels flat. It does. Once you're so acc- extreme on the yeah, other Yeah, you ends. acclimate so quick to it because the 15, 18, 20% grades are just so commonplace that when you get to like 8%, you're just totally spinning out. And, and, uh, yeah. And like it's, oh man, there's so much strategy. Well, there's, there's not so much strategy. It really is like fuel, 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 your Fueling. body. Mm-hmm. And, um, and patience. But yeah, patience, but also, using those parts of the ride that are either downhill in between like the stair stepper climbs or the 4%, 6%, 8% recovery sections to just spin and let your body recover as much as possible. And boy, when you, when you follow those kind of key things, um, patience, fueling and recovering your body as opposed to trying to make up time, like I, I did it. Like I did it. I did pitches up to 30%. And I kept, before that, I just kept thinking like a right angle is 45 degrees. <laughs> a right angle is 45 degrees. So 30% is like two thirds of that. Like that's insane. But then I would just come back to the moment and say right now. No, I just, uh, a right angle is 90%. Oh, right. 40, 45% is half oh, of that. Oh my God. Oh, I thought it was going to be so much worse. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so my my lack of prowess in math really served me. I kept thinking, oh my God, I'm like hot just thinking about that. I totally kept thinking that 45 degrees was a right angle, but yeah, you're right, it's not. Okay, yeah. whoa. I, mean, I don't think you can bike up 90 degrees. No, I know. But then half of 90 degrees is 45. Yeah. And then, oh, it's so much more doable than I thought. We're, but we're at one third 90 yeah. of 90%. But I will say that 30% is no joke. No joke. We no ride joke. here. What is, I wonder what the authors are. Did you figure that out? Oh, 15%. 15%, okay. So we biked yeah. a lot at 20%, 15 to 20%, yeah. I would say. We had some We had some climbs like that. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. I know. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Where do we want to start? Well, let's just take, like, two takeaways. Uh, you, you, you touched upon it, but you got to say yes to these opportunities. Uh, at first, in my personal experience, when we were presented with this opportunity, logis- logistics and timeline didn't add up on paper. It didn't, it didn't make sense. So you step away is, is a practice that we developed when we went on the road for six months. Like step away when things don't feel aligned, but you know that there's something there. Step away, assess, and come back to the situation. Uh, so interrupt the process, just like that girl did on the uh, in the ocean. Yep. Came up and then went back down. Interrupt the, the pattern. Yeah, she came up. She got herself calm. She went back down and saw the most amazing thing in the world. And that's... That's it. And it doesn't take that long because we actually, it was less than a day that I was like, are we in? You're like, we're in. Let's do it. Yeah. So that timeline was super short. It was short. BJ of years ago would be like, 
would it would probably be weeks or months in that span to make a decision. Yeah. Um, but I knew yes is I've practiced yes so many times that yes, that we need to do this. We must do this. There's something down there waiting for um I'll speak for myself. There's something down there on the other side of this that that is waiting for me. So the challenge of just like a uh, 50K race and then an Ironman and then jumping into a five-day cycling challenge on a road bike, which I haven't ridden in years. On I don't have a road bike, so I'm riding on someone else's bike and in a foreign country <laughs> and with people I have no idea. And I'm all by myself the first day um, and leaving Clark here and all these things that could that could be potential outs. Uh, I knew yes was the was the answer. And so that's one thing I took away from this is that let's get back to the yes. Let's get back to the yes. All the things are not going to add up. They're never going to make sense. Yeah, it's going to be like we're never. already putting out so much money with the races and the travel and okay, now here's another cha-ching and just say yes. Just say yes. There's something there waiting. <laughs> something there waiting. Oh my gosh, and what was waiting was so special. It's like, more than I could have ever it's it, it was a life changing. Yeah, I, I, that might be overused. But I don't it's, use it that much, but it was life changing for me. Yeah, I feel like I've gone through a lot of life transformative experiences. This was life transformative. Le- absolutely, like I had a rebirth. I am not the same person that I was a week ago. By not e- not even close. A week ago, I was flying from Nosara to San Jose. You were on the first day, day of riding. First day because I came one day late. And just stepping into the unknown and just kept reminding myself that that's where all my possibilities live. And of course, the logical mind was just focused on the possibilities being like, okay, can I possibly do this? But I had no idea it was going to be being inserted into a family, being loved, um, watching uh, the ego being directed in right direction for the collective and the good of all, um, watching the relationship of how they share the road and how it's for everyone, whether that's a mom pushing a stroller and there's no bike lanes, there's no sidewalks. So whether that's a mom pushing a stroller down a 20% pitch and a truck coming and a group of 50 cyclists, like it's for everyone and everyone makes sure that the other person is safe and clear. And what happens when we are looking at the collective is that we are also included in that. So of course we are safe as well. It was just, it was beautiful. It was, it was so much, it was just so much more rich than, than I could have imagined. And I have been to Costa Rica. I have experienced the beauty of the people there and the Pura Vida, you know, living in the flow of life. But to be so immersed in this local community of cycling and, um, you know, to, uh, to be embraced, uh, to, to, for the Ticos and the Ticas to embrace the uh, gringos and the gringas was just so lovely. And we had, you know, we had me riding. Um, It doesn't matter if you're a slow rider. It doesn't matter. Like if you have that endurance engine and you have gears and you have a good mindset, like you're good to go. No one is left behind either. But yeah, so there was me. And because of where I was situated in the group, which was towards the back, I got to ride with the local legend who, um, his name is Hoel. And Dan and Jennifer talked about Hoel a lot, but he's like the, kind of like the father of cycling. And he's, you know, working with these, with these future generations of, of cyclists and, you know, to like Luis Mora, who is a pro and a couple of his pro, um, teammates, you know, at the front of the pack and, you know, and he's fist pumping me at the top of the climbs. And so there's no separation. It's not like, Oh, here's the slow gringa coming up, but like I get to ride with Howell. Like it was amazing. And, uh, and there's, he doesn't speak any English. So it was just him and I just riding in silence together for so many miles. It was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. There was no concentration of like, oh, I'm in the last place or that one person's behind me, so I'm not that bad. There was none of that. There was just no space for it, right? We talk about environment being stronger than your will. And that environment is so supportive and so loving and so powerful that like, I just didn't have any of that chatter at all. I think the... the the moments of silence like that on the ride. Like you didn't have to talk to them. Howell was one who didn't speak English. There were there were a few that could speak some English and there were some that were really uh, efficient, you know, proficient in the English. But in my experience, I rode a lot of time right next to somebody in silence. 
and it was maybe we do a, a steep climb, look over each other, give the thumbs up or a pat on the back, mm-hmm. and then it was on to the next next little climb. So that's just the the mutual understanding that we're in this together. And I love that from day one we were accepted as family. At day one, the first meetup, it was like hugs, high fives. Here we go. We're in this. And you just sort of learn how they ride as a group. You just learn on day one, like you're just, you're just right there immersed in it all. And, um, that's when I met Tony. Um, that was cool. Like riding up Las Antenas. Was it Las Antenas? That's the first day. Yeah. The first day with Tony. And that's, you know, for the next few days, we were riding together at moments and just in appreciation. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, the community down there is, it's just full of joy. So much joy. Oh, they're so funny and they're smack talking and they're laughing. Oh, laughing and, always. and it's just so simple. Yeah. It's so simple. Like the the way their smack talk is even so simple. And the way they laugh and they just and you're just laughing. You know, I remember being right in the middle of like probably six of these tikas and and tikos. And um, so the tikas are the girls and the tikos are the guys. And um, they're all laughing and, you know, and I'm just laughing with them. And I have no idea what's being said whatsoever, you know. Um, And they know your name. And you sometimes have two names. Yes, sometimes you have two names. Um, they all have two names. Um, so it's kind of, and you're just like, oh my God, the guy with the blue giant. Like, okay, What's the, his like name? just wear the same outfit every day, yeah. right? Because so, like, the second day, we probably had 50 riders. That was the biggest day. Yeah. At least 50 riders. Yeah. It was so cool. Um, so, yeah, I like your takeaways. Like, just, you, yeah. you just gotta, you gotta do it. You gotta say yes. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, for me, I think the takeaway was just watching the ego being directed in right direction and right direction, meaning capital R right, like for the good of all. It was beautiful. It was so beautiful because these roads, cars are close to you and trucks are close to you, not because they're trying to be jerks, but because the roads are super narrow, but never, I mean, I'm pretty, I, I don't get scared on the road. Um, I'm very calm on the road. But like, I didn't even think about it here. Like it was just, it's everybody's road. It's so, it was so safe. Yeah. I felt like it was super I, safe. I always felt so safe. I, I mean, we, and we rode two by two. So yeah. I would say 95% of the time we were riding two by two, but also for those that are familiar with cycling, 95% of the time you were in that small chain ring in the front. Rarely did you go to the big chain ring. Oh yeah. It was constantly low chain ring, small chain ring, and then just using the gears in the back. And then tell people about like, so there's, there is always a climb of the day. So, and those climbs are either cat one climbs or beyond category climbs. HC climbs. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond category. Which is whores category, beyond (laughs) category. But leading up to those. So when you get on the climb, it's, you know, go for it. Yeah. Whatever you feel like. Whatever. But between the climbs and leading to the climbs, what's the pace? It's super easy. Like, <laughs> I ride easy on easy days, but this was really easy. Um, conversation pace. The last day, we had a 30-minute downhill, somewhat downhill ride, and it was just so easy. It was easy cruising. I was talking to everybody, like conversation, having fun. Um, that's what it's like. Then you get to the climb and things disperse. Some people want to go off the front. Some people have a moderate. Some people want to hang in the back. Um, but there's always a support vehicle at the, at some point of the, of the route. And there's two of them. And then there's, there's always the, the Ticos, a few of them who will just, you know, peel off and make sure you're okay. We'll stay behind. We'll go up to an intersection and hold cars off. Or if you don't know the route, um, we'll make sure that you get on the right route. Don't take the turn. There's, they're always looking out for you. Um, no matter what pace you have going up, no, t- no gringo is left behind. No. All right. Let's, um, so in closure of this, and we encourage you to check out the stories if this is sitting on your heart. Oh my God, you guys, you gotta go. You gotta go. It's so amazing. It's like nothing I've experienced. What? I have to say two, two things. One, what? Dan is just so <laughs> immersed in the community and the language. Yeah. He is so amazing. animated. It's, I, I kind of, 
was looking forward to the moments we would stop and he would talk, everybody would ask him about the stage, the gringos would, but then he would talk to the, the Ticos and he would just have like this flow and knowledge and confidence yeah, in all the, quite the routes and what gearing to use and how long we were to the next climb. Cause like, I think he lived there for about eight did. years or so, yeah. but Dan's great too. Cause he, he'll, he'll be, he'll stop and on this trip, typically he's riding, but on this trip he was actually playing support role. And he'll stop and say, okay, you've got about 200 meters, super tough stuff. And then you're going to get a reprieve for about 2K. And then you're going to have 100 meters of like what seems to be unrideable, <laughs> but just go, like you can do it. And then you're, you know, and then you've got another flat spot, so recover. And then you've got like another 300 meters, just like steady climb. So he, so you'd be like, okay, oh my God, that's it. I got like 200 meters, a hundred meters of this. Like, so that was really cool too. And the second thing was the water cooler talk. I just loved capturing that. So look at my story when you get to these stops and then all the Ticos were, and Ticas were like congregate, congregating around the the water cooler in the back of the pickup. And they were like laughing and you have no idea what they're talking about, but you're just like, oh my God, they're so passionate and, and appreciation and appreciative of this moment and, and being together. Yeah. And the food, like, I mean, it was just like I mean, bananas galore and chips and Coca-Cola. Um, like Dan had vegan cookies for us and Oh it Lenny was, and Larry's, yeah. Yeah. So like every my bag of gels that I put in my pocket went from like four gels to like non existent by the end of the ride. I just wasn't even packing anything because everything was available for you. Um and then so one thing that we discovered down there was this stuff called the right stuff which is super high sodium, like drink additive. And for me doing, um, what was it? Day, um, was it day day three or was it day? It was day three. Day three, which was the Sacramento climb where you're, where that's the one where the pitches get to about 30%, which is not really close to being a right angle, by the way. Um, so I put a whole packet of right stuff, which was, what did you say, like 1,700? Somewhere almost, around there, yeah. Almost 1,800 like milligrams of salt of sodium. So I did a full packet of right stuff and then two scoops of goo roctane. So that was my jet fuel and it was perfect. And also you, you, you dump all extra weight before going up this climb, which was super fun. It was like getting all hyped up. So like everything was out of my pockets. I had one bottle, like bike bag gone, Every drop as much weight as possible. So you want to get up that climb, you want to be as light as possible. So I discovered jet fuel, and so I think you're probably going to start using that and uh, yeah, it's leading a perfect into combo, Kona. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, I think I found my, and it's so delicious. And it's so funny that that's like what you, you needed an answer for salt intake, and then you find this stuff. So yeah, it's, cool. So it's everything's yeah, just always chill out. You're going to get the perfect, answer, right? right? Like just, yeah. it will be provided for you. Um, so, okay, let's wrap this piece up, but I just want to talk about um, memorable, one memorable moment. Well, I have two. <laughs> They're short. Go. One was the climb. What was the climb? La Vuelta. La Vuelta al Mundo. Um, the El Aguacate. Aguacate. Um, aguacate. Um, climb, which is a longer climb. It's very, very similar to the one I do here in, uh, at, uh, on Palomar, but with some steep stuff. The second half of this one down there in Costa Rica is like the second half of, of Palomar. Uh, but it was really, really hot and it came at mile 55. Yeah. The, the big climb of the day comes the like ride. at like mile 60 yeah. of the day. The total ride was 90 miles and 10,000 feet of climbing. And this was the biggest climb. And I just remember being so hot and very humid and thick. Like the air was thick because of that humidity. And and Tony had brought me potatoes that day. I remember he brought me potatoes. And I got to this point of the climb where I just wanted a potato and I couldn't get it out. So I stopped, took the Ziploc bag of potatoes. I had one potato left, pulled it out and it like slipped out of my fingers and rolled down into the the gutter there. (laughs) This very like vibrantly green lush gutter. Um, And I had to get off my bike and walk down there and get it because I really wanted it. And that moment to me was like, it was just so hot, but I knew I could finish the climb. So I just got back, had my potato and got back to the, got back to the grind. And that, that to me was a really pivotal moment. That was day two and it just 
it was the turning point for me, you know, coming in here with fatigue and, and, uh, and, a, and a big lead into this with Ironman and the, and the 50K. It was kind of like the turning point of like, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. Uh, and then the second one was the last day with El Cacao. Uh, being able to let it rip. Uh, we had ridden the climb already two times. This was the third time. And I was with uh, Abel, uh, who was a super funny dude. He's so awesome. So awesome. He's like Very drinking. nice to meet you. Yeah, very drinking. <laughs> He's 24, drinking beer at like, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, uh, wondering why I'm not drinking beer. Um, <laughs> so sweet. And then mixing his rum and, rum and Cokes uh, in his water bottles. He's awesome. But uh, that uh, El Cacao climb, it's less than a mile, but it's got some steep. And then I just sent it. I just went. He was with me. You were back with Howell. And uh, everybody else was ahead, but it was something I could go after. And so I just started hammering and hammering. I knew he was right next to me, right on my wheel. Uh, and we just kept going. I felt that rush of, of giving a really good race effort. And we got to the top, and then it flattens out. And so I got on his, he was like pointing to his wheel, back wheel. So I got on the back of his wheel and held on as much as I could. Um, and then there was another attack. So that's super fun. Like at the end of this ride, these guys off yeah, the front are 50 like miles attacking. Then, yeah. Super fun. And then we cruised, yeah, to that final road. And then I decided to attack because I saw one of the pro riders, Annabelle. And then there was somebody else. Was it Tony? I can't remember. And then I just attacked. It was like my legs are toast, smiles are keep I think going. It was Douglas. Douglas, yeah. And uh, the pro rider came right after me in like, I don't know, 10 seconds. Yeah, he's like 23. Yeah. And then he zoomed past me. He smiled, which is awesome. <laughs> I just, just put yourself in that position of, of going after these guys. Um, but that was, to me, those were, those were memorable. How about you? I think for me, one of the most memorable was, um, go, climbing Sacramento, which was on the Tuesday of the, that's the one that's got all the big hype, right? Like the 30% grade and, and, um, and it's, I mean, make no mistake. It's hard. It's hard for sure. But you just gotta, you're just, what I loved about it is that it just put you in, it put you by force into the present moment, because the only thing you can, can focus on is turning the pedal over. Um, and so I'm just on like the toughest part of it. And I look up and I see the guys, I see like Luis Mora and Abel and Douglas and all these like top end guys, like, and they're all kind of hanging out on this corner. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to get my breath. Because I don't, here's the thing, you don't know how far you have to go. Like, you just kind of never really know, even though Dan's saying, like, you got 200 meters, you got this. You, like, you never really know. There's just like a little bit of like this well intentioned untruth that's happening throughout the entire experience. But it's wonderful. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to, okay, good. Oh, God, thank God. Like, they're, wi they're waiting. I'm going to stop. I'm going to catch my breath because my heart rate's through the roof. I'm just going to stop and catch my breath. So I start getting closer and they're like, yes, -y, yes, -y. and they're, and they're screaming and I, and they're like, go, go, go. And I'm like, no, no. And they're like, go. And I'm like, no. Cause I'm thinking I'm going to stop and I'm going to rest and catch my breath. And they're like, go, go. And then they're at a corner. So there's a corner I can't see around the corner. And I'm just dying because it's so steep and it's so hard. And they're cheering me on and they're just like sending me so much love. They've probably been standing there for 20 minutes waiting for me to come up. And they're just like, go to Jennifer, go to Jennifer. And I, and I turn the corner and I see Jennifer and it's like, you know, it's not as bad. So I think I'm kind of like getting to some kind of reprieve. It's probably around 15 or 18%, maybe a little bit more, maybe 20. And I'm coming up to her and she's like, that's it. You did it. And that like, when you're doing something that's so hard and you realize that you're done and like just this overwhelming relief and satisfaction and joy and belief in self, like it takes a lot for me these days to like have an emotional release. Like I spent years like having these huge emotional releases. So I got to dig really deep into the cavern for like any kind of residue of emotion that's still down there. And when she told me I was, and I was like, no, she got this all on film and she's like, yeah, you did it. And I was like, no. And she's like, yeah, you did it. And I'm realizing now that those guys were telling me to go because I only had a little bit more to go, but like that I was willing to keep going, even if it was like more miles 
you know, like I didn't override and stop and try and rest. Like I just trusted them and I went and then it was over and I was like, oh no, here come the tears. And I just felt this like well of emotion come up and I just let it come up and it was, oh my God, it was, that was the transformational moment. I cannot believe like what I, what I did, um, I will never be, I, I'm just will never be the person I was before that trip who was doing pretty good. Like, but now I have up leveled, um, through that experience. And I, I now knowing what you're getting yourself into, like, I still can't wait to go back. I know we're going to go we'll back. We'll be back for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, that was my memorable moment. It was That's a, a good sacramental one. climb. That's a good one. Yeah. All right. We got to wrap this up. We're almost at an hour and a half. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. So we're wrapping it up. Three days. <laughs> Pure Vita cycling challenge. They have them three times per year. January. Five days. It's five days, three times per year in January, in May, and in September. Yep. So um, check them out, Pure Vita Cycling. Uh, Jennifer and Dan, uh, we did a podcast with them on uh, this past week. So check that one out, number 314. And um, of course, check out my Instagram stories, Jess's Instagram stories, some posts uh, to get a really good idea. And of course, reach out to us if you have questions. Uh, the Pura Vida is flying high here with us both as we uh, re reconnected on this trip after going our separate ways in the weeks before. And uh, definitely something special for couples um, to do, but not necessary. And also for those uh, seeking you know, that strength in being independent and free um, and to grow as as an individual um, in a supportive community. Because as I said, is from day one, you're, you're in the family and they look out for you always. So give it a shot. Say yes. Beautiful. All right. Thanks for joining us. 